when I was a, a younger man, which I found out, by the way, um, I'm not, apparently. I was at the OU game yesterday, and we're there with my college roommates. Some of us hadn't seen each other for 20 years, and we're sitting there, and we look across to the student section where we used to sit and get our sunburn, and my friend leans over and says, you know, the last time we sat there, those kids weren't born yet. <laughs> I haven't forgiven him for that, and I won't. It'll be 20 more years before I see him again. But when I was a younger man, I remember uh, my parents had some uh, CDs of classical music. Um, let me do a little cultural translation because I am old. For the older folks in the crowd, CDs are shiny records. For the younger folks, we used to put music on these shiny round things and put them into players. Okay, Everyone now on the same page? We know what we're talking about? We had these CDs with classical music. It had you know, Ravel and Vivaldi and Mozart and uh, Beethoven and all your favorites. And uh, I was a big fan, because I really was a nerd even then, I was a big fan of Bach. Bach was my guy. So I, I enjoyed listening to a little bit of Bach. And I thought he was interesting as a character. Uh, later in life, I learned more about him because I just thought he was an interesting guy and his contributions to churches and the way that he influenced Christian life with his music. Then something cool happened later in life that I discovered a fascinating little fact. If you look at the bottom of all of his musical manuscripts, of which he wrote more than you can name or count, at the very bottom, he would put three little initials, SDG, at the bottom of essentially every manuscript, which is a little confusing because those aren't his initials, Johann Sebastian Bach, not SDG. SDG is what he wrote at the bottom of every page of manuscript, and it stood for these words we consider today, sole deo gloria, glory to God alone. David, I can't advance my slide again, I'm sorry. Glory to God alone. His thought was that whatever he did in the world of music, whatever he accomplished in life, in art, in work, in all of his use of his gifts and ability, he wanted it more than his own name, which he would sign in very little letters, in much larger letters. This is done to the glory of God alone. I want to spend a little time this morning talking to you about this important idea of glory to God alone. What does it mean? What does it mean for us to even talk about the glory of God? I, it's a word that I think we feel like we know what it means, but when we pause and have to define it, it's actually tricky. I sat through a doctoral level class one time where a student was giving a paper they had written on the glory of God, and it was a great paper, I just before I criticize him. It was a fantastic paper, and I really enjoyed it. It got all the way through and thought, yeah, that was great. And then the professor says, just one question, can you define the word glory for me? And we realized that he had written 20 pages and had never defined his key term. And worse, on the spot, he really couldn't give a coherent definition. It's one of those things you know what glory means, but I don't know if you ever sat down and tried to write a definition. The glory of God means what? And there's no verse in the Bible that says the glory of God means. It's just a term that's littered throughout the pages of Scripture. And it's a little bit difficult to define. The best I can give you actually comes from a scene in the Old Testament uh, in 1 Kings chapter 8. 10 and 11 is the dedication of the temple. So Solomon has built this temple for the first time to God's glory and they've, they've come and they're worshiping God and dedicating the temple. And on that occasion it says, when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. There's not a definition in there as such, but there is a sense of what we're talking about. Two things actually that are very important. One of them is in Hebrew. The Hebrew word for glory is chavod, and it literally means heaviness or weight. That there was a sense of oppressive weight in the room. And the other detail it gives us was it was like a cloud. Anyone else see the problem there yet? If I say to you, uh, what was it like? And you say, a cloud. And I say, describe it to me. And you say, heavy. I'm thinking maybe you've never seen a cloud before. They're kind of the opposite of heavy, right? And yet that's the description given 
that there was something in the room with us. It was like a cloud. It, it wasn't like us. It was just there. Oh, so you mean it was light and airy and barely apparent? No, it was heavy. The room became more solid because it was there. How heavy? Was it just kind of foggy? So heavy the priest had to leave the room because they felt like they were being crushed by the weight of this presence in the room. And what the text says was, that is the glory of God. That's not a definition as such, but a depiction of it. And you get this idea, in fact, anytime that God kind of shows up. In a sense, we say God is everywhere. He is not far from any one of us. He's always present. And yet there have been times where God is extra present, capital P present. At the top of Mount Sinai, God comes down, the, the mountain shakes, the sky is dark, lightning and thunder, and people say, we don't want to go up there. And they're right. God, presence at the top of the mountain, in the temple, same feeling. I think something similar happened on a Friday long ago in Jerusalem when our Lord was crucified. And it says that the earth shook and the grave gave up their dead and the day in the middle of noon was turned to darkness and the temple curtain split down the middle and tore. Again, it's a similar depiction. God showed up and was present in a way that was heavy and weighty and noticeable. So the idea of glory is used to describe the weight of the reality of God. God is not your imaginary friend. He is not a fictional character. In fact, what the Bible claims for God is so much the opposite of that, it's hard to put into words. And so we just fling words at it like glory. That God is not just real, he is the realist. He is the most real. He is the only reality and everything else that exists merely borrows its reality from him. He is what is and we are whatever he allows us to be. He is substance. He's the creator of all things. So then when the text says to give God his glory, for example, God says, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. One of the great sins, in fact we could dare say, the great sin of the Old Testament literature, all revolved around this idea. Uh, think about your Ten Commandments. Don't use God's name in vain. Why not? Because you're treating God like he's not God. God isn't your next door neighbor. You don't speak of him like someone else. He is God. Don't have any other gods because no one else should be treated like your God. He does not share. He and he alone is real and will be recognized as that. You don't have carved idols. Why? Because it was the height of insulting to point to something you had made and say, that's God. He says, have you not felt my heaviness in the room? Do you not know what my glory is? That's not me. It can't be. So all the great sins of the Old Testament revolve around the idea that God will have the recognition of who he is and will not share. It's based on his being. I mean, do you realize, re read that sentence again. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Do you understand if any of you said that, you would be a horrible person. If I stood up here and said, my name is Ben, I will have my glory and I will not share. That's a bad human being, right? But as they say in Texas, it, it ain't bragging if it's true, right? God is what we pretend to be. Get that? God is what we pretend to be. God is actually that. And it would be inappropriate. It would be false to recognize or treat anyone else as what he is and he won't allow it. So when the Bible uses the word glory in, in the sense of a command, it's saying glory is also then the recognition of God as he is. When you listen to our great songs of praise, so many of them just say things like, you are God, right? Because the best thing you can say about God is, you are God, right? There is, there is no higher, everything else is just an attribute we give him because we need something else to say. Otherwise it'd be a really short song. 
you are powerful, you are almighty, you are all-knowing, you are loving, on and on and on. We say those things because we need more words because he deserves them. But we've, we kind of emptied the, the barrel there with the first sentence, you are God. To give God his glory is to recognize him as he is. Everything that God has done does that job. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Astronomy guys, so of course I'm going to throw in that verse. Because I love the idea that everything God has made, from the tiniest particle to the brightest star, and all the space in between, every second of every day is giving God his glory. They recognize in their own strange way their maker no star believes he is creator of the universe. No bird in the morning that sings is singing his own praise. The birds chirping this morning were saying, praise to God, praise to God. Like all of them exist and know they exist because of someone else's kindness. In fact, there's only one thing in the entire universe that doesn't recognize God as God. And it's us. Only one thing in the whole universe that thinks they could be, as it were, their own gods. And tragically, it's us. Everything else that God has made gives him his glory and exists to recognize him as he is. Every work of God accomplishes that same task. Why does God do what he does? He says, for my own sake, for my own sake I do it. For how should I, my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. Isaiah 48. Again, you read that sentence. If anyone else in the room said that, you would be a horrible person. Why are you doing that, Ben? Well, for me, for me, for me, I do it. I don't want anybody else to get any credit. Again, that would be absurd because you're you. Because you are a created thing, a contingent being, a conditional existence. You were made to be. You don't get to claim anything. But he is what he is. And he says, I need you to know that. And so every time I do something, it's to remind you of who I am so you can know me as I am. God acts in every act of God is so that we may know his glory and know him as he is in all his greatness and grandeur. The gospel itself falls under that category. John 1, verse 14, speaking of the incarnation of Christ Jesus, John writes, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What is John saying there? He says, Do you remember that God in the Old Testament, His presence was so heavy we had to leave the room? Remember the God who said, For my sake, for my sake, I will get my glory by my works? John said, I saw His glory, His glory, and it was that man. And that's, that's the absurdity and the beauty and splendor of the gospel. That it says, that glory that you couldn't stand to be around walked around the streets of Galilee and Nazareth and Jerusalem, and we killed him. But he became one of us. And we didn't like that very much. But that means, again, when you read that, that even this, why is God saving us? There's a lot of answers to that question. Most of them are pretty good. I think he loves us. I think he wants us to be with him. I think he wants to be with us in fellowship and unity and harmony for eternity. But he's also doing it for his own sake because he's God and he wants us to know him as he is. What kind of God is God? He's a gospel kind of God. He's the kind of God that would come down here and be one of you to save you. He's the kind of God that would be Jesus Christ. He's the kind of God that would become something he's not in order to die to save the people he made who don't know who he is. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the Father, the glory of God himself. Even the gospel itself is an act that brings to God his glory, to show him to us as he is. When we say that Jesus reveals to us God, we mean that. That we get to know God in Jesus Christ in a way never before known. He is the glory and expression of God. Furthermore, we could continue. Maybe we can. There we go. In 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11, it talks about the different things we do as humans. 
and each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is the one who speaks uh, oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Got caught up in a prayer at the end, didn't he? Got excited. Every ability that you have, every experience in your arsenal, every gift in your life, it is not there for you. It's not yours. It is borrowed. God and God alone is reality and everything else is a shadow. Or as uh, our song leader is going to remind us here in just a few minutes, you are the sunshine and I am the candle. He's everything and I'm a glimmer of that. And so everything that he's put into my life, he says, that's to be used to serve others, not me, and in so doing, bring God his glory to recognize him as he is. When I serve myself, I am treating myself as God and I am not recognizing God as he is. I am pretending that I do not have a creator, that I myself am what the universe is all about. When I serve others to the glory of God, I am recognizing that this is a story about him. And I'm merely in it. That he and he alone deserves all the glory forever and ever. Every gift in service is to bring God glory, to serve him as he is. So whether you do eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Not just the acts of service, not just the things that you say, hey, that's obviously a Christian thing to do. Go do that to God glory. Paul says, whatever you do, even the unimportant things, relatively speaking, I mean, eating's pretty great. But whatever it is, even the unimportant things in your life, the ordinary things in your life, in those things, find ways to bring God glory. This is something we don't do nearly well enough in churches and we don't do nearly well enough with our kids, so let me hobby horse for just a minute and get on my soapbox, is that we have a tendency to think you can serve God by being, well, like Ben, you could be a minister, or Derek, you can be a youth minister, you can do some kind of ministry, like you can work for a church and serve God or you can go out there and do something else, right? And I don't think scripture would allow us to think that if we read it carefully. Are you a doctor? Be a doctor to the glory of God. You a construction worker? Be a construction worker to the glory of God. You raising kids? Raise your kids to the glory of God. You an accountant? Do the math to the glory of God. I mean, whatever it is you're doing, I think we've told kids they have to make a choice between their faith and a career. And what we should have been telling them is choice between their faith and a career. And what we should have been telling them is be thinking about how to use the career, whatever passion or gift you've been given, whatever it is you want to do in life, find a way to use that for God's glory or don't bother. Because that's what it's for. God has given you that ability to serve him in some other and unique and beautiful way. We desperately need Christian doctors and Christian nurses and Christian teachers and Christian politicians and Christian construction workers and Christian accountants, Christian lawyers to get me out of jail later. We got to have that, right? We need those people in the world and they bring God glory when they do it. Whether you eat, you drink, whatever you're doing in the ordinary things, every act of life is to bring God his glory, to honor him as he is. And then something beautiful happens in the middle of that. When you do it right, all of modern life and existence in psychology is about this you know, self-actualization and finding who I am and understanding myself. And we make ourselves the center of our attention and try to find ourselves. And the Bible gives us this beautiful alternative. Forget yourself. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. The Bible says there's an alternative. People who are looking for themselves deep inside never find much and are often disappointed by what's down there. The Bible says if you look and you find the glory of God and you behold him and look steadfastly at who he is and recognize him who he is, you're able to forget yourself and in the process know more about yourself than you ever knew before. 
that you're a creature who is a reflection of this God. A being made not in your image, in His. That His is the image and yours is merely the reflection. And there's something beautiful about forgetting about yourself. You notice the repetition in this? In the previous verse, to my name, to my name, I will have my glory. And in this verse, it says, not to us, not to us. People who actually know God, just repulsed by the idea of, of receiving any of his glory. There's a scene in the book of Revelation where John tries to bow down and worship the angel. And the angel gets mad. The angels, no, 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 stand up. None of that. Why? Because the angel knows God's glory. And it's just sickening to him to even think of anyone treating him like God. But we humans let people do that to us all the time. Not to us, not to us, but to your name give glory. The practical consequence of glorifying God is self-forgetfulness. Knowing him as he is, as kind of a funny consequence, allows us to know ourselves as we are before him. And then there's a last piece of the story too, and I'll, I'll end with this, although I could talk a lot longer because I like this topic. So we do not lose heart, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 and 17. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Here's a thought for you today. What if the story of the gospel is not about some kind of strange pass or fail test where you either get into heaven or get out of heaven or whatever, where it's you know, just kind of a membership club thing. What if, as we are, none of us would even want to be in heaven? Just stay with me a second. What if as we are, like the priest in the temple, if we got that close to God, we'd get out of there? But what if, each hardship, each obstacle, and each opportunity in life where we reflect to God His glory makes us the kind of being who could be in the presence of God forever. What if God is actually making us day by day able to be with Him? These light momentary afflictions are preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. Paul knew Hebrew. He knew the Greek word didn't mean heaviness. So he said, I'm gonna throw another one in to catch your attention. That there is a heaviness around the throne of God. And he said, we couldn't bear it. And when we suffer and when we endure and when we pray and when we grow in Christ Jesus, we become able to be the kind of people that are in his presence. God is shaping us and preparing us to be with him because we're not ready. There's a reason they said to Moses, you go up the mountain. Nobody else wanted to be there. But God says, I want you to come up the mountain. And through every obstacle of life, he is preparing us to be with him. Christian life transforms us and prepares us to stand forever in the presence of the glory of God. So here's my appeal to you this morning. Suppose your life is a book and you chose the bottom of every page or every sheet of music to write sole deo gloria, glory to God alone. What page have you reserved for yourself? What page of your life do you still claim is your own and not God's? Put his name on it. What part of you, what conviction, what belief, what action, what behavior, what is there in your life that is not his? Put his name on it. Recognize him as God and give him his glory. That's what we're here to do and only in that can we find him and find ourselves as we are. My custom is to end in a word of prayer. This morning I'll do something different. If today you have seen the glory of God and known you have not lived up to it, if instead you wanna put the name of the glory of God upon you, to recognize him as he is and forget yourself. If you need to confess sins, repent of sins, or put on Christ, if there's anything we can do to help you. In this room is a body of people trying imperfectly to bring God his glory and we'd love to help. We're gonna stand and sing. If you need any assistance, you can come on to the front.